Uh, this morning, we're continuing our sermon series uh, called Journey Towards Jerusalem, and we're going to be looking at a passage about prayer. But before I get into that, I want to just say a couple things about Lent, because that's the season that we're in right now. now Lent is really not a, a Catholic thing or a Protestant thing. It's just a Christian thing. It's a Christian thing. Lent is a season of preparation. It's a time where we, where we, we, we are making a return back to God. We are looking at the ways in our lives that we have departed, that we have turned our, our backs on God, and we are saying now we are going to turn our faces back towards Christ, towards the cross, and we are going to move in the direction of our Savior. Lent is a time to do a heart check. A heart check. It's time to go in yourself and to ask, what is going on with me? What do I need to set down? What do I need to pick up? What is God calling me to in this season? But in the middle of all of this, it is so important for us to remember that Lent is about a saving, rescuing God. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Now, in our gospel reading that we heard, uh, we heard a parable about prayer. And I don't know about you, but prayer can be sort of a frustrating topic, right? Um, Prayer is one of those things that we know we're supposed to be doing. We know it's a part of the Christian life, but I think we have a lot of questions about it, maybe a lot of uncertainties about prayer. Exactly how does it work? What is it for? It can be sort of a frustrating topic for some, for some. I think there are really three different postures that uh, can be a part of our thinking about prayer. On the one hand, we can be very optimistic about prayer. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you know someone who, when they think about prayer, they're very optimistic. God will listen. God will answer the prayers that we pray. And so they're very fervent about praying. They pray often. They're very confident. Prayer works. Prayer works. Try it. And then there are some of us who maybe are a little bit more pessimistic. I'm not so sure that prayer really works. But, you know, we know we're supposed to do it, but we're not really quite sure how effective it really can be. Some people I know hardly pray at all. They hardly pray at all. I think there's a third posture, maybe a posture of indifference or confusion. Maybe somewhere in between those two extremes that um, you know, we, we pray, we know it's a good thing to do, but we're just a little confused about exactly how it's supposed to work. I think beneath it all, there's a question when we think about the topic of prayer. There's a question about the relationship between human agency and divine action. There's a real tension there. Now, C.S. Lewis once said that there's this funny thing that happens when people pray. And it, it seems that a lot of the time we are informing God of what he needs to know or of what's going on. As though God doesn't know what is going on or doesn't see exactly what we have need of. Prayer is kind of a funny thing. Uh, A few weeks ago, I was uh, helping with a small group conversation over at Lake Avenue Church, and I was sitting in uh, with a group of high school students, and they were talking about prayer in their small group. And uh, at the end of this time of of us talking about prayer, one of the students uh, said, you know, Prayer is a weird thing because um, I pray, but oftentimes when I'm praying, I'm just, I'm sort of asking God to not bust me for something I did wrong, or there's this girl I like, and I'm like trying to ask God to help me out with that, or I've got some big test, like a chemistry test or something. By the way, our kids are studying trigonometry, right? So, you know, I've got some big tests that I want to work on. And, and I'm, I'm afraid I might not do well on that. So I'm asking for God to, to help me with that. And he said, and, and I thought it was very poignant. He said, it, sometimes prayer just feels a little bit selfish and petty. A little selfish and petty. And 
he said, it seems like prayer should be about something more. Like there's gotta be more to it than that, right? And, and I said, I think you're right. I think, this is what I said to him. I said, I think that it is true that you should pray for those things that you think are kind of selfish and petty. Don't stop doing those things, even though it might seem a little strange. Do that, do that, pray, pray those prayers. Seriously, pray those prayers. But you're right, it is about something more. It's not just about that, those little things. It's about something bigger, something more. And, and we got into a, a little bit more of a conversation, and I said, you know, sometimes I think we think about God in, in a couple of different ways, kind of using some metaphors, right? Like often when we think about prayer, we think of God as like something like a, a cop or a firefighter. All right, no, no, uh, no, no harm to anybody who's a cop or a firefighter out there. Love you, okay? But sometimes we think about God like this when, when we're praying, right? Like God is just looking to find out what I did wrong. And he's gonna chase me down and there's gonna be consequences, right? God's mostly concerned with like your moral trip ups. Or, you know, I think of God as like a firefighter. Like God is really, when I pray, there as a resource to put out my fires, to put out, you know, to, to put out the, the things that are going wrong, to rescue me out of like a burning building that I set on fire, right? Sometimes I think we also think about God, and especially here in America, as something like a cosmic vending machine, right? You know, like if only I put enough rigorous prayer into the machine, then God will respond, right? God will give me what I'm asking for. If I just do it enough, God will respond. But it's interesting that when we look across the history of scripture, the metaphors that are used to refer to God in relation to prayer are really Mostly two different ones. God is a shepherd or God is a parent. Those are the two metaphors that often get used to refer to God in prayer. Now, the idea of God as a shepherd is probably a little bit less relatable to us. I mean, right, we're, we, we haven't come from agrarian cultures. Well, maybe some of you have, but most of us have not. So the idea of God being a shepherd who sort of leads us to the places of food and and, and water and keeps us from predatorial uh, beings, you know, th this, this, this kind of picture of God, it, we can re kind of relate to it, but it's a little bit strange for us. But I think we can probably relate more easily to the metaphor of, of uh, God as a kind of parent, right? And now, of course, the, the tricky thing about that metaphor of, for us is, is that we all, and let's be clear, we all, have a little bit of baggage when it comes to parents, right? Like nobody has perfect parents, even though it was my mom's birthday yesterday and I told her, mom, happy birthday. You're the best mom in the entire history of the world and in all history of moms. And it's true for me, it's true. But of course I can be a little hyperbolic. I can say that kind of thing about my mom, but, but of course no one is perfect, right? No one is perfect, no parent is perfect. And Jesus is aware of this. It's not like Jesus doesn't know about this problem. But Jesus still uses the metaphor of a parent in describing this idea of prayer. Now, in the parable that we heard this morning, Jesus uses this parental metaphor. And I want to say a couple things about this before we get into the actual text and look at some of the things going on there. Some of the context around it. It's important to understand first that right before Jesus gives this parable, he's actually speaking about prayer in, uh, in terms of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Right? And he has just been speaking about the Lord's Prayer in the passage before, right before he's giving this parable. And then here Jesus continues his teaching on prayer, but now with a different emphasis. It's a little bit tempting to want to see in this parable, to want to see Jesus as giving us a kind of technology of prayer. Because after all, I mean, the disciples asked, Lord, how should we pray? How should we pray? And Jesus gives them the Lord's Prayer, but then he moves on to this parable, and it's a little bit different. He's not giving us a technology of prayer here. Pray exactly like this, in this manner, at this time. 
uh, using these steps, using these words. He's not necessarily doing that here when he's talking about prayer in the parable. Now, historically, interpreters have looked at this passage and they have said, or many have said, well, the kind of prayer that Jesus is talking about in this passage is one of persistence. Be persistent when you pray. Pray all the time. And there's some truth to that. God does call us to a kind of persistent life of prayer, no doubt. But that's not quite Jesus' concern in this passage. Rather, Jesus is concerned with how our prayers reflect an accurate recognition of the one to whom prayer is offered. Jesus is concerned here in the parable with how our prayers reflect an accurate recognition of the one to whom prayer is offered. In other words, in this parable, Jesus is concerned with a kind of worldview that would inform and energize the way the disciples are praying. In other words, Jesus is concerned with your theological imagination, your prayer imagination, what you think about the God to whom you are praying. Jesus is concerned about that question. So if we go back to the parable, and I want to just take a minute, and I think you have pew Bibles, right? Maybe they've never been opened. I don't know. But, no, I'm sure they have. But I want you to pull out your pew Bibles. We're going to be looking at this passage, and the reason I'm having you do that, you'll understand in a couple minutes, but there's a very particular phrase that needs to be carefully interpreted in this passage. But we're looking at Luke 11. Uh, it's actually page 840 in your pew Bible. I'm not going to reread the parable here, but I am going to just kind of restate it. I'm going to talk through it. So follow along. Jesus basically comes to his disciples and he says, okay, suppose a friend of yours comes to you in the middle of the night and he asks you for some bread because he says that he's got a friend at his door who's apparently traveling, coming through town, and that friend needs some food, needs a place to stay. And you don't have any, so you go to your friend next door, and you, you knock on the door, or you, you at least stand there, and you say, please, can you, can you share it? Can you help me? Can you get up and give me some bread so that I can give it to my friend who's coming through? And the voice from behind the door says, no, go away. I'm asleep. My kids, we're all in bed. The door is locked. Now, at this point, the disciples hearing this would probably feel aghast at this part of the parable. It would be shocking to think that that would be the first response, potentially, of the man inside the house. And I'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus essentially goes on, and now we're looking at verse 8, says, I tell you, even though he will not get up because he is his friend, at least, and this is in your translation, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he asks. I want to just take a minute and sort of camp out here on verse 8. There's a very interesting translation question here. Now, as many of you know, the New Testament is not written in English. It's not written in King James English. Sorry if that's news to anybody. Probably not. It was written in Greek, okay? And in the original language of this text, there is a word, a Greek word, anaedia. And that is the word that takes on the phrase in your, uh, in your verse, in your uh, version of the scripture, uh, because of his persistence. Because of his persistence, the word persistence, anaedia. Now that word, it means something like shame, shameful, or even 
more accurately, dishonor, really means something very negative. So there are kind of two ways that this text has been interpreted. On the one hand, many biblical scholars and theologians have thought that it's about the shameless persistence of the person praying. But the grammar is really unclear. And I won't bore you with the syntax and the details of it, but just to say that the grammar is fairly complicated and it's actually not clear who the Anaedia is referring to. Is it referring to the guy praying or is it referring to the guy sleeping? Maybe this is one of those super brilliant, clever Jesus moments where it's kind of both. I don't know. But it's not entirely clear who the Anaedia is supposed to to, to, to belong to. But what does seem clear is that if we, re, if we interpret the word any idiot as dishonor, which is probably a more accurate rendering of this second part of verse 8, and if it's referring to the man sleeping, this makes more sense with what we know about the historical cultural context in which Jesus and his disciples lived. So it probably should be interpreted like this. The sleepy man will get up in order to avoid dishonor. In order to avoid dishonor. The second reading, the reading that I've given you is more likely, and the reason for that is because in the ancient Near East, the, the culture of hospitality was a very serious it was a culture of shame and honor. And the conventional norms of hospitality went something like this. If a neighbor came to your house, even in the middle of the night, and they were asking you for bread because a, str a stranger or a friend of theirs was coming through town and needed some food or a place to stay, and you didn't have the resources to give them, if you were to go to your friend next door and ask him for those resources, of course, of course your neighbor would be expected to give you what you asked for because in a culture of honor and shame, if you do not give what is being asked of you, you bring dishonor onto yourself as a neighbor and onto the neighbor who is asking. And furthermore, you bring dishonor onto the entire town. The whole village would suffer dishonor for not being hospitable. That's how seriously the laws of hospitality, the norms of hospitality were taken in Jesus' day. And so when we get to the, this, this moment of the parable, it's almost like the disciples would have thought it was a laughable absurdity to even consider for a moment that the neighbor would not get up and help his friend. Of course he will respond, is what they would be thinking. Of course, how could he not? I mean, does the guy want to bring dishonor on the whole town? Of course he will respond. And then Jesus goes on to say, how much more then, if you, being evil, do not even, how much more would we expect that God will provide for you in prayer? Jesus is point here is that this is really how we should be thinking about God when we pray. Of course, of course God will respond. Why? Why would we expect that? Why would the disciples have expected that? Because God has bound himself to the people of God in a covenant of love. That's why. God has bound himself to the people of God in a covenant of love. And this is something that the disciples would have understood in this moment. It's not in our passage, but it is very, it probably was very clear in their minds that God has to uphold his honor with the people of God because God has made a covenant deal a, a covenant of love with the people of God. And this means something. I'm going to come down to illustrate what this is about. The disciples probably would have had in mind 
the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15. You know the story. Abraham is a pagan statue builder. And God comes to him, calls him. And God says to him, I am going to make you a nation. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And I'm going to make you as vast as the sands of the seashore. And then God performs a covenant with Abraham. And this is how covenants were made in the ancient world. Someone would go out and they would get some animals, particular kinds of animals, and they would cut those animals in half. And they would set the the pieces of the animals in pairs, but there would be a space to walk between. And when the covenant is being made, the two people involved in the compact, the deal, would stand at each end of the covenant line. And they would walk into the center to make what's called a bloodline, a covenant. And they would meet each other in the center, and they would look each other in the eyes, and they would grab each other by the groin, sorry, in the Bible. And they would say, you can't make this stuff up. If I break this covenant, if I break this deal, then let it be done to me what has been done to these animals. That's how serious the covenant is. When Jesus is talking to his disciples about the kind of God who will get up to respond to us in order to avoid dishonor, he is referring not to the fact that God needs some kind of uh, reputation repair, but to the fact that God has bound himself to the people of God in covenant love, has said covenant love. And so when Abraham is there making this covenant with God, and this is something that the disciples would have been familiar with, Abraham falls asleep. God causes Abraham to fall asleep. And then God walks or comes through in a burning pot pot and a torch of fire, God comes through the bloodline and passes back and forth. And Abraham is asleep, not walking through. And what does that mean? What it means is that God is saying, you will not uphold your end of the deal, but I will uphold your end of the deal. I will uphold my part of the covenant and I will uphold yours. Because I know that you will not keep it. You will not be faithful. Your people will not be faithful. And when we look across the story of Israel, we know that it is a story of God's people failing over and over. But what we also know is that it is a story of God responding. Of God coming after the fugitive people of God. We know that is the story of God coming down into Egypt and liberating the people of God from bondage. We know that it is a story of God pulling them through the Red Sea while they're being chased and pursued by their enemies. We know that it is a story of God telling Jonah to go to Nineveh, even though Jonah went to Tarshish, which was the other way, on purpose. And God went and chased him down and made sure that he got to where he needed to go. Why? Because God has bound himself to the people of God in covenant love. This is the God who responds. This is the God who responds. And so then Jesus says in the parable, therefore, ask, seek, knock. Of course you should ask and seek and knock and understand that God will give these good gifts to you. God's not going to give you a a snake. God's not going to give you a scorpion. Who do you think God is? This is the God that they are thinking about. How much more will Jesus respond to what you need? I think prayer is not, it's not really about what we think it's about. It's not about just asking God for things. 
It's not about asking God to change his mind. It's not about endlessly petitioning in order to see some, something be different than what we want. Prayer is about aligning ourselves with the God of creation. Prayer is about understanding that God has been playing a song, a symphony across eternity. And you and I, we are, in, we are invited to join in this song, to catch the rhythms of this saving God's work in the world, to listen, to become present to the God who is present to us. Did you know that God is always present to you? Always God is present to you. It is we who are not present to God. God is here, but where are we? Right? I mean, go back to Genesis 3. That's the question after the fall. Where are you? Where are you? It is we who are not present to God. What's going on when we pray? Did you know that prayer is something that happens when we pray we are being caught up in the whole triune life of God at one time. Did you know that? Just think about this for a minute. What is it that causes you to pray in the first place? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prompts you to pray, to cry out, Abba, Father, God, hear me. The Holy Spirit causes us to pray. And then the Holy Spirit lifts us up into the presence of God, the Father, and Christ, who sits at the right hand of the Father. And as we speak our prayers and our cries through the Spirit of God to the Son, the Son intercedes to the Father on our behalf, and the Father hears the prayers that we pray, and he responds because God, the Father, sees you, sees me, sees us, and responds and sends the Holy Spirit to be that response. Sometimes when we think about prayer, we think, if we're honest, God just doesn't care. Maybe you are in a difficult marriage. Maybe things are falling apart. And you've asked God to intervene, and it doesn't seem like anything is changing. God, where are you? Do you care? God sees you. God understands you. Maybe your family is going through some kind of turbulence. Maybe you have a child that has walked away from Jesus or was never there in the first place. And your heart is troubled. And you pray, God, please touch my child but you don't see God responding. Maybe it's a job you can't get or a job you want to get out of, and it doesn't seem like God is responding. You pray, it doesn't seem like God is hearing you. I guarantee you God sees you and is hearing you and is listening to you. God is certainly listening to you. But here's the thing. Jesus says, that God will respond to us, to you, with the Holy Spirit. That is the gift. It's not about getting what you want. It's about getting what you should get and what you really want, which is the Holy Spirit. And if that doesn't seem like something powerful to you, I would just question you, to, I would just ask you to pause for a minute. Maybe somebody's a little disappointed, like, well, so we get the Holy Spirit, okay. Yes. You get the spirit that God used to create the world. When the creation first began, it was full of chaos and darkness, tohu wa bohu in Hebrew. It was chaos, and God sent the ruach, the spirit of God, to flutter over the face of the darkness. And God then speaks to the creation and gives it form and purpose and beauty. 
God responds to the creation and gives it order and gives it meaning and gives it purpose. That is the spirit that God sends to you when you pray. That's a dangerous thing to ask for because there is no doubt if you ask for the spirit of God, the spirit of God will do things in your life and you may not be ready for it. The spirit that we get, the Holy Spirit, is the same spirit that brought the people of God out of Egypt and also out of exile. It is the same God, the same spirit that has brought Christ into the world. It is the same spirit that Jesus operated in during his earthly ministry, performed miracles. It is the same spirit that the disciples uh, used in their ministry to heal people to feed the masses. It is the same spirit that God gave to them to do what they did not think and could not do for themselves. And it is the same spirit that was with Jesus on the cross. It is the same spirit that rose Jesus, that raised him from the dead. And it is the same spirit that will lift us up into everlasting life so that we too can come before a resurrected, crucified God with the scars of our lives written on our bodies, almost as a grammar of horror, yet to know that God has taken from those scars by the power of his own resurrection and given to us absolute transformation and recreation. That is the same spirit that God sends to us a spirit of resurrection, power, and hope. Last week, a friend of ours at Lake Avenue Church was speaking about his wife who just a couple years ago was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer right at the beginning of the pandemic. And they have prayed and they have been weeping and asking for God to bring healing, to bring transformation, and it's just not happening. And my friend was talking about it and just saying, I just feel like God is, is not there. And this is one of those parts of our, of our family story. It's like a, a weird puzzle piece, you know? It just, I don't know where it fits. Where does it fit? And the story of our lives, where does it fit? And I think sometimes that's how we feel when we think about the trouble that we're dealing with. We don't quite know where it fits. But I wanna encourage you, friends, I wanna encourage you. God has given you the Holy Spirit and it is the greatest gift you could ask for. And it is the thing that will sustain you through trouble. It really will. And it will sustain you and get you through moments where it seems like all hope is lost. And it will also give you resurrection hope. And it is the same spirit that will change your view so that you will begin to see that the work of God is not just about what has happened behind us or in our present moment, but it is also about what will come in the future. It is also about a work that God will complete even after we die and are raised to new life. The story will go on. What happens here is not it. It's not the end. And this spirit will help us see that. And it will change the way that we live before the face of God. And finally, the spirit that God sends us is the same spirit that helps us look at these elements to see the crucified God who is for us and to God what we cannot be for ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to stake my life on that. Amen.